And Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. What a great phrase. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. And so he set off and went to his father. But while he was still afar off, his father saw him, was filled with compassion He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked, what's going on? And he replied, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him, but he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command, yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. And then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. For the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. So we know this story, this incredible, beautiful story of the son who defied the expectations of his culture and broke all the rules and took his father's property and left home and went and lived in dissolute living. And then at his most desperate, repented and thought he would come home and confess his sins. But the story's really about the father, isn't it? Who obviously had some deep longing and had missed his son. And you almost get the impression that every day that dad was standing out on the front porch looking down the road in the distance, wondering if today would be the day. And on the day that it is the day, that he does see the sun coming down the road, he runs and he embraces his son and he welcomes him home and they celebrate. And we know that Jesus tells us this story in order to give us a model for how we are supposed to be. Because we know that this is a story about how God is. That God is like this parent who welcomes his children home with an unconditional love. I guess I'm a little emotional because... Today is Sebastian's birthday. He's three years old today, so this story of fathers and sons resonates with me. And I, of course, vividly remember that moment three years ago today when 
Sebastian had just been born and he wasn't even a minute old. And, and I went over to t- touch his hand and he reached out and he grabbed my finger in his hand. And that spontaneous, unconditional love. And it's a, such a surprise that you're capable of that sort of, that you don't have to like develop it, you don't grow into it, that that kind of love just burst upon you in an overwhelming and spontaneous way. And this is the kind of love that this father in this story has for his son, regardless of what his son has done. Because one of the interesting features of this story is it doesn't seem to matter that the son has repented or that the son is confessing. It's almost like the father hasn't even really heard what the son has said. It doesn't matter. For this father, all that is important is that the son has come home and he is embraced in this overwhelming, unconditional love and welcomed and celebrated. This is who God is, and this is who we are supposed to be. This is who Christ is calling us to be. That all of us, in our best moments, have that kind of love. And the challenge is, how to live that kind of love day in and day out with difficult co-workers and spouses and kids that frustrate us or people in the other car, red light runners and that sort of stuff. Last week, we began this series on forgiveness, and we talked about anger and how anger is this problem that many of us have, and we aren't sure what to do with our anger. And we said that the realistic idea is not that you can avoid it altogether. Of course, we get irritated and frustrated and disappointed and and angry, but but the real trick is how do you take that and then turn it into something healthy. So the healthiest anger is that which does not focus on the past, on revenge or payback, but turns to the forward-looking and tries to solve problems and tries to move forward in some sense of, of, of reconciliation and healing. And we talk about the fact that for the Christian tradition, forgiveness is the primary method. This is the way that we handle our relationships and or handle our anger and restore our relationships, and move forward as God's people. But there's something interesting about this story of the prodigal son. Is it, is it really a story about forgiveness? Martha Nussbaum, the philosopher who we talked about a little bit last week, she doesn't think this is actually a story about forgiveness. She thinks that there's tr- three traditions in the New Testament that you can locate. One is a st- form of transactional forgiveness. If you repent, if you confess, if you do penance, then you will be granted forgiveness. And we're all familiar with that kind. We've encountered people like that, right? And that is in our biblical tradition. But fortunately, it's not, it's not the ideal. It's not the best. She says the second model is a kind of unconditional forgiveness. People who forgive regardless of whether there is any repentance or confession on the part of the other person. They are willing to reach out and forgive people even with no expectation in return. And the best example of that in contemporary memory are some of the family members of those murdered at Mother Emanuel Church in Charleston. I mean, many of us were probably amazed when Dylan Roof was arrested and at his bond hearing, some of the family members of those who had just been murdered a few days before stood up and said, publicly and in front of Dylan Roof, I forgive you. I pray that God will have mercy upon your soul. We're just amazed by that. And not every family member could do that. Not every family member has, has still done that. But that some of them were able to. And it shocks us to think, you know, are we capable of that? Could we do that in similar circumstances? That sort of unconditional forgiveness. And Martha Nussbaum says that she thinks that this story exists in even a third category, which is an unconditional love that doesn't even 
seem to mess with forgiveness. That it is just this overwhelming sense of love and grace that is available at all times. And that's what this father represents for us. So it's a rem- the story may be an indication that forgiveness is one way that we get to reconciliation and healing, but it's maybe not the only way. But I suspect that since none of us are God, that sort of unconditional forgiveness at all, that unconditional love at all times and in all places, though an ideal for us, is not how we're going to operate day in and day out. And so we need these other methods to help us deal with our anger and our hurt and to move forward in rebuilding our relationships and reconciling with each other. But at root, we are supposed to be like God, and God is like that. God is unconditionally forgiving and unconditionally gracious because God, God is a forgiving God because God is fundamentally a giving God. God is giving of blessings to us, overwhelming blessings at all times. And so forgiveness is just one form of that giving of God. And so part of what we have to do as the people of God is to let God's gifts flow through us to other people, including God's gifts of forgiveness, even at times when it is difficult or impossible for us. It is also important to take a moment to say that there are probably situations where actual forgiveness, where reconciliation of relationship is not the goal and not the possibility. Those families in Charleston were not trying to reconcile a relationship with Dylan Roof. They didn't want to have any ongoing friendship with him. So there are times when that is not the goal. We can think of situations of abuse and violence where reconciling the victim to the abuser is not what we are aiming for. What we are aiming for in those situations is a form of healing and moving forward so that the victim can find some peace and agency and empowerment and courage to move forward with their lives. So reconciliation is not always the goal. And it's also the case that forgiveness itself might not always be the best method to get to that healing and that reconciliation. There may be other methods of finding uh, healing and hope and moving forward in life. But for this sermon series, we'll be focusing in on forgiveness and maybe thinking about some of the more mundane situations that we deal with coworkers and in traffic and with spouses and with friends. They're kind of normal day in and day out situations where each of us need to learn to be kinder and more loving to each other And then when we do hurt each other, how do we repair that? How do we move forward? What is is the mechanism and the path for moving forward? So Desmond Tutu, who was the uh, retired Archbishop of Cape Town, South Africa, the Nobel Peace Prize winner and uh, anti-apartheid fighter, in his theology made use of this concept, uh, African concept of Ubuntu. And Ubuntu is the idea that our identity is only known to us in relationship with other people. That we can't truly be ourselves outside of being in good relationships with other people. And Tutu argued that people who understood this concept, who understood Ubuntu, were warm, welcoming, kind, and generous people. And I think, in essence, this is is the ideal, right? This is what we are aspiring to. This is the goal, and this is what this story is directing us to. We understand that our, rela- that our identity is deeply connected to our relationships with others, and so we are on the journey to become warm, welcoming, kind, generous people. Because God is that kind of God. And that's the kind of life that we are invited to imitate. So last week I gave you an assignment. At least one or two people checked back in on what, how they had done on that assignment. So I have an assignment for this week. And that is, this week when you are in one of those situations where you are easily irritated, 
and about to get angry, think about warmness, kindness, welcoming, and generous. And how in that situation can you be that type of person? And, I, and maybe even that needs to be a little mantra in our head this week. Warm, kind, welcoming, generous. Warm, kind, welcoming, generous. In those moments when you're about to get really frustrated and lash out at someone. Is it possible that just taking a moment to, deep breathe, to breathe deeply and think about those ideas might change how we react in certain situations? So can we in life become more like that? Now, to do that does not mean to give up fighting for what you know is right, fighting against injustice and oppression, because that's what Desmond Tutu did his entire life. He dedicated it to calling out evil for evil, speaking the truth to power, working to transform and reform his society. But if you ever saw him speak, even if you just saw him on TV, he always did it with a smile. He always did it with a warmness and an affection towards other people. So even as a justice fighter who led dramatic social change against an evil system, he operated as a person of warmth and kindness, welcome and, and generosity towards other people. We, so the basic message is, we are called to be giving and forgiving people because we worship a giving and forgiving God.